business show, but we like sports. So I want to start with a question that's related to both sports and business. Sure. And I want to talk about college sports and what's happening with college sports. It looks like it's it's new pro league, right? When you look at the transfer portal, that's very that looks like free agency, mm -hmm. but you don't even have a con. You could just leave at any point in time, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But then I also want to talk about NIL collectives. So they're saying John Calipari is going to start with at least five million dollars in the NIL, and I don't, a lot of people aren't really familiar with the NIL collective. They heard about NIL deals, mm -hmm. but it's like the NIL collective, a bunch of essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, like a bunch of wealthy boosters can just come together and just pool up a pool of money yeah. and just you know give kids. It's like a way to pay players under the gaze of NIL and not it be illegal, right? Um, so, so much has changed over mm -hmm. the last 18 months. So what's your thoughts on, on those two things specifically? Doesn't bother me at all. Um, and the more headaches it causes for the NCAA, the more headaches it causes for particular programs, the better I feel. Um, you've spent decades exploiting these athletes under the cloak of amateurism. And I would have respected it more if it were applicable to you as well. If you were a coach, you were in administration, and you didn't benefit off of the exploits of the athletes, then I'm down for it. But that's not what has happened. We've had coaches having a myriad of ways to generate revenue for themselves. Clinics, coaching in summertime, mm -hmm. uh, the salaries they've earned, speaking engagements, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen the athletes perform and we've seen the money come back to the universities. And what do they do? They funnel it throughout the universities. The administrators get a little bit more. The chancellors, the provosts, the presidents, they get a little bit more. Different other programs within the school that are non-revenue-generating -gener sports, they benefit from it. But the very athlete who went out there and performed and generated this level of interest uh, is somebody that you couldn't find it within yourself to ensure that you would, you would, they would be compensated in some capacity. And the reason why it resonates with me so profoundly is because, you know, I remember when Chris Weber, Fab Five, Michigan, mm -hmm. and those guys were complaining about stuff and whatever. And you have these folks on the having, you know, under the mentality, you know, you're getting a scholarship, you're getting a scholarship, you should be happy. But they were never happy. And how much of a stickler you were if folks got flights home. In Chris Weber's case, you going into a bookstore and you seeing a uniform, a jersey with your name on it. Mm -hmm. But if the store gave it to you for free, that's a violation. You know, stuff like that. You know that you're getting a vast majority of, the, of these high profile athletes from desolate environments and backgrounds. And you telling them they can't fly home for the holidays. They can't get a car. They can't, you know, you couldn't even rent them a car or whatever. It might've been a violation. So those kind of things, you would think they would have had the decency to be a bit lax and to understand with all the money that these athletes were generating that, you know what, you could turn a blind eye to certain things, all right? If the guy want to go home for the holidays, let him go. If, if, if somebody wants to come, if the parents want to be flown in for, you know, to be with him for Christmas because he can't, you know, he can't go home to see him, all right, we, we could turn a blind eye. You didn't do any of that. You kept, you would dog it in restricting what the athletes can get. So now that's not the case. You know, you reap what you sow. And the headaches that come with it, the coaches that can't take it, Cal no doubt is leaving Kentucky in part because of that. Nick Saban no doubt retired right, because right, of right, that. Right, right. When you, you say know? because of that, because of what? Um, NIL, transfer portal, the combination yeah, of it all right. and what kind of what kind of chaos it's caused because it's relinquished a degree of control from them. Nick Saban told me that personally. He could, he was before he retired. He was complaining about what a headache it was. You're talking about agents that are treating. He felt like they were damn near embezzling, you know, money, you, you know, from universities and stuff. You know what they were doing. Those were his. That was his terminology. He was completely turned off and utterly disgusted as to how things had transformed and how it changed. And I didn't blame him. I didn't think he was wrong. I was just saying the NCAA brought it on themselves because of how they were. So if these athletes find a way now to get paid, more power to them. You, more the, power to them. It's interesting because I was kind of thinking that. It's like that transition of the, the old model. Because even for Cal, his model was the one and done. 
So to see the one and done not work now, I'm like, well, what was really changed? And if you're going from a place like Kentucky, which has mm. a boatload of boosters, right. endless money, right, and going to an SEC school like Arkansas, where there are boosters, but it's they it's, got some money now. But they have Jerry, football. Jerry Jones. Is no, no, I'm saying they, they have the football component, but Kentucky's been playing well over the past couple of years. That change is happening with the coaches. You said Saban. I thought about guys like Roy Williams and like these older guys who had came in with a system both in college and and, and in fo- I mean college basketball and football to where you see new guys, Coach Prime, exceeding at this because he's able to adjust and get back to the well, players. Even like a, a Dan Hurley now who's just uh, just won. It's more about the players and figuring out it's transfer portal, it's NIL, it's all these things. Well, the first, first thing we're going to do as we sit down here right now is we're yeah. going to define – what your definition of success is. Okay. Because let me tell you something. Cal ain't been successful, not in recent memory. That's a fact. You got four over the last four years. I'm a Kentucky guy. Did, all right. Well, matter, he's still I that's know, not what I know, you I said. Know, I know, you I know, used the I know, word I know, success. I know, I know. And I'm telling you, they've been bounced out in the first round this twice. True. Lost to Oakland. Uh, a 14 seed. Yes. Lost to St. Peter's, the 15 seed. And then didn't, and then went to the second round, lost. Hasn't been in the Sweet 16 in four years. Didn't make the NCAA tournament. Okay, so you at Kentucky, which is blue blood. Okay, we know Can what we their reputation that term? is. Huh? Can we throw away that term? No. Who who's is UConn blue blood? Yes. What what is so define blue blood then? Lengthy period of time in which your dominance shines, where you're relevant. You're a big time program. You know, you're constantly in the mix for national titles. Um, the level of notoriety you gain is different from what the average school gets. Like, for example, Villanova's won a couple of national championships. Well, we want to talk about Villanova in that regard. Georgetown won back in the day. We want to talk about them in that mm-hmm. regard. North Carolina has been relevant since the 60s, 70s. Right. Duke has been relevant since you know, Krzyzewski arrived in the 80s. Bill Self had Kansas relevant since the 80s. Um, Kentucky with Patino, Adolph Rupp, obviously before him, yeah, but then yeah. Patino, uh, Tubby Smith. Um, now you got Calipari in 20. 12 he wins a national title yeah. those are the kind of that when you're talking about blue blood you're talking about programs essentially that could recruit itself you mentioned that program and That's everybody right. you know you you come knocking on somebody's door right. they're gonna open that door and listen to what you have to say a lot of schools heard no not those programs. That's right. all I mean by that. Right. So like a UCLA would fit in that. Even though they haven't UC- won since 95. U- UCLA hasn't won since Kansas, 95. Kansas, Kansas U- won. UCLA three. hasn't won since 1995. You consider them that out west because of John Wooden. What they've done in the and, and what And Bill Walton, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, all those kind of things. The old Bannons and all of those guys Westbrook. in 1995. Westbrook. Well, those Westbrook, are Final Four teams. Okay. Because you look at it from that standpoint. You'll look at it from there. But that's what I'm talking about. Kentucky's in that line. And, so, and not only that. Part of it is not worrying about the finances because your alumni base mm-hmm. and the money that's funneled into the program is not something that you have to concern yourself with because there's going to always be people to take care of those folks. That's Kentucky, Duke, North Carolina, UCLA, Kansas, and now you come. From a financial standpoint? Yeah, Even from a financial standpoint, absolutely. The, the, the absolutely. Fo- I'm, I'm asking from, from a financial standpoint only because we know that football brings in majority of the money for these, these schools. Duke is an exception in a sense. You're talking about the school. I'm talking about the program. Yeah, program. Okay, got you. got you. I'm talking about the program. Got you. UConn's program, basketball, can give it, their facilities are better than Kentucky's. Yeah, men's and women's. 